Father in heaven, thank you for your word and thank you for the mystery of the kingdom that you have bestowed upon us, the gifts that you've given to us. Help us to appreciate them better as we look at them one last time today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. We are in Revelation chapter 10, verse 7, which saith, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished as he preached the gospel to his servants, the prophets. And as we've seen, this mystery of the kingdom is identified as the message of the seventh angel, which we find in Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11 verse 15 says, or saith, The seventh angel sounded, and there arose loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. So what is the mystery of God? It's that the kingdom is transferred from Satan to the angel of the covenant incarnate Jesus Christ, from the false angel to the true angel. The kingdom is transferred from the first Adam to the last Adam. And it's the entire cosmos that is repositioned and becomes the kingdom of God, our Lord or Master, as opposed to Satan, and of his Messiah, the second Adam, the Son of Man, as opposed to the first Adam. And the 24 elders, or archangels, who sit on their throne before God, fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, O Lord God, the Almighty, who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Now, the other times in Revelation, it says who is and who was and who is to come. But now he's come. When the seventh angel sounds, everything is finished, and he's not going to come. He's come. So who is and who was, we give thanks to you who is and who was, who art and who wast, because you have come. You have come. You have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Or actually, you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and the time to give their reward to your bondservants, the prophets, and to the holy ones, to those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the land. Now, this happens in A.D. 70 the judgment on the dead of the old covenant, those who were under the altar, who were waiting to go into heaven, who were told to wait for a little while, they, as we will see, ascend into heaven and reign with Christ for a thousand years. So that happens at the seventh trumpet, and the seventh trumpet then is revealed in everything in the rest of Revelation. Because all the stuff in the rest of Revelation happens real fast. Up to now, we've been dealing with a whole 35-year period. Now we're dealing with right at the end when the seventh trumpet sounds and Jerusalem is destroyed and Rome is destroyed and the millennium starts and the kingdom comes in its fullness and the mystery is completed. So what is this mystery of God? Well, it's the transference of the kingdom into Christ and the fullness of Christ's reign over the nations. And the sign of that is the destruction of Jerusalem and the chaos in the city of Rome, which destroys the old Rome. And in a sense, Jesus begins to reign at at ascension, but the fullness of his reign comes in A.D. 70. And I think that seems odd to us. We are so used to thinking that Christ begins to reign, well, that is if we're traditional Orthodox Christians. (laughs) If we're dispensationalists, we say Christ's reign starts sometime in the future. But... A modified dispensationalism would say that his reign is in an invisible sense today. And we're used to saying that that starts in A.D. 30 at the Ascension. And that's true. But it also starts in its fullest historical form in A.D. 70 because that's when the son of the bondwoman is cast out. Remember what Paul says in Galatians. He says, right now... Ishmael and Isaac are both in the house. Right now, the son of Hagar and the son of Sarah are both in the house contending. But very shortly, 
the son of the bondwoman is going to be cast out, Hagar, Mount Sinai, the Jews, and then there won't be any question about where the kingdom is. See, right now there's a question about where the kingdom is. The Jews say we have the kingdom, and the church says we have the kingdom. After A.D. 70, there's no doubt about it. There never has been. Jews today don't have a kingdom, and they'll tell you they don't. They're waiting for one to come, but they don't have one. And A.D. 70 settled that question. So the mystery does that. Now, it says the mystery was proclaimed to the prophets, so it's not something brand new, but it's something that is revealed in its fullness. And we were looking at it last time. We saw in Romans 16 that one aspect of the mystery is that the gospel goes to all nations equally. Everything is repositioned from Adam to Christ. We are one body in Christ, not one body in Adam. We are married to Christ. Colossians 1, 25, 27, Jesus reveals the hidden word which was hidden in the tabernacle, locked up in there, remember? And it was locked up in the Hebrew tongue, and now it's given in all tongues. So the gift of tongues is important in that it shows us that the mystery of the kingdom has come. The gift of tongues authorizes the translation of the word into all languages. Or to put it very precisely, every language is now a legitimate vehicle for the word of God. Previously, only the Hebrew language was a legitimate vehicle for the word of God in its purest form. But now every language is a legitimate vehicle for the word of God. Now, we're not all supposed to learn Hebrew. We're supposed to reform our language, and every language then becomes appropriate. Colossians 2, 2 to 3 tells us that the mystery is to be in Christ, and in John's Gospel we find that Christ is the incarnate tabernacle. And so now we can look at page 101, which has now become 102, which I gave you last time, and take up where we left off. We have not only the mystery of the kingdom, but we have the anti-mystery of the Antichrist or of Antichrist. There is in the Bible no such thing as the Antichrist. When people talk about the Antichrist, they're putting things together in the Bible a certain way. The Bible talks about the beast, the land beast, two different things, the man of sin, which is probably the same as the land beast, or one form of it. But the Bible never talks about the Antichrist. The word Antichrist is used in the plural to refer to those who are organized against Christ, and it refers to the Judaizers in John. But the spirit of Antichrist or anti-mystery is given us in Second Thessalonians 2, verse 7, which is one of Paul's earliest letters. And he writes, The mystery of lawlessness or mystery of iniquity, is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Well, what is this? Well, we've already seen that the mystery in Christ is the Word of God. And so now we have a mystery of lawlessness, which is a mystery of an anti-word. Lawless. Anti-Torah. The mystery of the kingdom is the Torah. The mystery of iniquity is anti-Torah, lawlessness, iniquity. Now, the Torah was locked up in the tabernacle, and the Ten Commandments were inside the ark. Where was the mystery of lawlessness locked up in the Old Testament? What corresponds to that? Locked up. We have been over this and over this and over this. It's in the EFA. <laughs> I knew that someone would know. In fact, I knew exactly who would know the answer to that question. Okay, it's in Zechariah 5. Let's remember it. Zechariah 5, verses 5 to 11. Then the angel who was speaking with me went out and said, Lift up now your eyes and see what this is going forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is the EFA going forth. EFA is a bushel basket. This is their appearance in the land. Behold, a lead cover was lifted up. The lead cover corresponds to the gold cover on the ark. 
And this is a woman inside the Alpha, and he said, this is wickedness. So the mystery of wickedness is in the Alpha, the counterfeit ark. He threw her down in the middle of the Alpha and cast the lead weight on its opening. And then these two storks come, and they carry it to an anti-temple in Babylon. Babylon means the gate of God, and so that's the false Bethel, or house of God. And she's set up. So you have the temple of God, the tabernacle, with its ark in the middle, and the cherubim on either side of it, and the gold slab, and the law of God inside. And you have the anti-temple in Babylon, where the Tower of Babel was built, and you have in it this round epho with a lead lid on top and storks on either side and wickedness down inside of it. Now remember, this woman, this mystery of iniquity, she is the harlot in Revelation. Just as the mystery of the kingdom is open and the temple in heaven is open and the Ark of the Covenant is opened up and the kingdom comes out and Jesus is put in charge of everything, at the same time, the anti-temple is opened up, and the anti-ark is opened up. The lead lid is taken off the ephah, and the woman comes out, and she sits enthroned on the beast. And Jesus rides on the cherubim, she sits enthroned on the beast, and there's the conflict. So the mystery of iniquity is revealed in the man of lawlessness. Here in Second Thessalonians, the character of it is called the man of lawlessness in Revelation 17. It is the woman of lawlessness. In Revelation 17, verses 5 and 7, upon her forehead the name was written, A mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and of the abominations of the land. Verse 7, The angel who said to me said, Why do you wonder? I shall tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. The mystery of wickedness. That's the false church. Now, you have the church and you have the priest. The priest is the husband. The church is the bride. That's true in Israel and it's true today. Jesus is our priest. We are the bride. Now, the counterfeit is... The woman of lawlessness is the false what? And the man of lawlessness is then a false what? Priest. Listen to what's said about the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. So the Holy Spirit here through Paul tells us that the coming of Jesus that they're looking for to happen in their day, something that's near, which we know is the destruction of Jerusalem, and Jesus had predicted it in Matthew 24, and they were looking for it. And Paul says it's really a couple of decades away at least. He says, look, let no one deceive you. It will not happen unless the apostasy comes first. Now, what's the apostasy? Well, it's the falling away of many Christians that happens in the A.D. 60s. And Paul refers to this in his later letters. He says, Demas doesn't walk with me anymore. And he mentions other people who had been Christians and who had fallen away and become Judaizers and become opponents of the kingdom. There is a great apostasy that happened in the church in the A.D. 60s. And Christians fell away from the faith and turned against the true Christians and started turning them in to Nero, and to the Jews. So the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness, or iniquity, man of sin, is revealed the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, in that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Now, this is a reference to the high priest in Israel taking a seat in the temple of God. He's the only person who had access to the temple of God. Do you not remember when I was still with you? I was telling you these things, and you know what restrains him now so that in his time he may be revealed. Who was it who was restraining the Jews constantly through this period? The Romans. That's right. 
And if you were to study the idea of restraint in the Bible, you'll find that the word restraint is used for civil rulers. That's the primary meaning. For instance, when Saul was anointed as king, God says, I am anointing him as a restrainer of Israel. And that is the essential definition of what a civil ruler is. He is a restrainer as well as an avenger. So the restrainer is the civil government, is the Romans, and he is restraining the Jews and the total apostasy of the Jews so that in time they may be revealed. For the mystery of sin or lawlessness is already at work. Only he who restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. The Roman restraint was taken out of the way in A.D. 64 when Nero turned against the Christians. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by appearance of his coming. The one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders. Now, we're just going to stop here because we're going to come back to this when we look at the land beast. We look at Revelation 13, we got the sea beast who comes out of the Gentile world, and we got the land beast who comes out of Judaism, and it's this guy here. And so we'll come back to it. I wanted to point out to you primarily that the revelation of the mystery of the kingdom is accompanied by revelation of the anti-mystery of the anti-kingdom, which is lawlessness. And although the man of lawlessness in the sense of Judaism was destroyed in A.D. 70, the principle of it continues. In other words, right now, we are in the kingdom, and the mystery of the kingdom has been revealed to us. The Bible's been finished. It's been translated into English. We have one church, but we still have the mystery of iniquity floating around in the false church. And there are always false churches with false gospels, and there are always perverse teachings that corrupt the true church. And our confession says it very well. It says churches are more or less visible, and some have declined to the point that they become synagogues of Satan. In other words, the mystery of iniquity is at work in every church. It's at work in our church. Every church is not as good as it ought to be, and the corruption of Antichrist is always there. But we're still a true church. And there are churches that are a whole lot worse off than ours are that are still true churches. And then there are churches where Antichrist is simply taken over and they become counterfeit churches. So this is still very relevant. And the first time it happened was in the apostolic age, but it continues to be the problem right along. At any rate, the revelation of the mystery is corresponding with a revelation of an anti-mystery. Now, we can understand this a little bit better if we look at the essence of the mystery. This is a letter D in your notes. The essence of the mystery is Emmanuel, God with us. The estrangement between us and God is gone. Remember the estrangement, the exile. Garden of Eden, and we are kicked out, and cherubim and a wall of fire is there between us and God. And the cherubim will kill us if we try to get back in there. And throughout the Old Testament, every time this is pictured, it's pictured the same way. The tabernacle, and you've just got a whole series of degrees of who can come near. In the temple, the same thing. Some people can come this near, some people can come this near, some people can come this near, but nobody can go into the Holy of Holies and stay there. We are all estranged from God, exiled from God, and God dealt with us at a distance. But the coming of Jesus is God with us, Emmanuel. And God with us means God comes down from heaven and joins himself to us and takes us up to heaven with him. So now we are in the Holy of Holies as often as we want. As it says in Hebrews, let us draw near. Because we can. People in the Old Testament were not allowed to. And the order of the application of blood in the Old Testament is always you put the blood on the horns of the altar and at the base of the altar. You have a descent, and then the fire is lit, and the fire goes back up. God comes down, Emmanuel, he joins himself with us, then he takes us up to heaven with him. And so all the things that were locked up in the Holy of Holies are now accessible to us. Because we're in the throne room now. Now, God gave the people of the Old Testament a little bit of it. 
but not a whole lot. He gives most of it to us. He gives all of it to us. Now, why? Well, because the three gifts of the mystery of the kingdom are for grown-ups. <laughs> in history, as God lays it out in the Bible, has two stages. It has childhood and it has adulthood. And when we were children, we were invited to eat of the tree of life, but we were told not to go to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because we weren't grown up yet. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil has to do with eldership and maturity and rule and passing judgments. It doesn't have to do with knowing right and wrong. Adam and Eve knew right and wrong. We've studied this before. We have to keep coming back to it. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the phrase knowledge of good and evil, refers to judicial authority. And so it says in Deuteronomy that the small children who have no knowledge of good and evil doesn't mean that children don't have knowledge of good and evil in a moral sense, but it means that they're not kings. It says about David and Saul and the other kings that they had knowledge of good and evil. Solomon was one who had knowledge of good and evil and so passed judgments. That phrase refers to being a mature adult and no longer a child. What does Paul say in Galatians? He says in the Old Covenant we were children. But now we're not children anymore, which means that God expects more out of us. In the period of childhood then, throughout the Old Covenant, who were our teachers? Angels. And how they teach us? Angels taught us by means of animals. Remember, that's our phrase. In the Old Covenant, when we were kids, angels taught us by means of animals. Animal stories, animal sacrifices, animal food laws, animal proverbs. The animals were set up to show us how to live. We can still learn from animals today, but we don't have to because we can learn from people. In the New Covenant, Jesus teaches us through other people. There is a maturation that takes place. We get off the farm and into the city. Now, the gifts that were locked up were not just locked up because Adam sinned. They were locked up because God told Adam in the beginning, you're not ready for these things yet. The gifts that are locked up have to do with the knowledge of good and evil. They have to do with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And Adam and Eve were eventually going to get to eat of that tree. God told them, every tree is for you, but for right now, don't eat of it. Why? Because you're not ready. They're like a 20-year-old man who says, I'm as good as anybody else. I know as much as anybody else. I'm wise. You're a fool if you do that. And the world's full of them. What are these things? Well... They are Aaron's rod. Aaron's rod is made from a watcher tree, and it blossomed with white flowers. It means he became an old guy with white hair. He is an elder. It's a sign of eldership, and he is the one who is set to watch over Israel. So the watcher tree, or almond tree as we say in English, the watcher tree is a guardian or overseer. See, we have the word overseer in English. In Latin, we say supervisor. That's the Latin form. Supervisor, overseer, watcher, ruler. Aaron's rod that blossoms with the white hair makes him an elder, an overseer. That's for grown-ups. And now that the new covenant has come, Jesus gives us that maturity. What does it say in Romans chapter 5? I know most of you remember this. It says that Jesus did much more than Adam lost. Adam didn't lose being mature because he never was mature. He lost his status as a baby. But Jesus comes and gives us much more than Adam lost. He gives us not just the tree of life, but the tree of knowledge. He doesn't just restore us to the Garden of Eden where we start over again as babies. He finished the work and He restores us and makes us adults at the same time. Now, as adults, we now, in essence, all of us have the white hair of Aaron's rod. And it's the rod of intercession, which means we rule, we oversee through prayer. We go to the Father and we can talk to Him and tell Him what we think ought to be done. Second of all, what was locked up in there was the law. Now, in a sense, you've got to give the law to children. 
But in another sense, the law is given to rule by. The primary meaning of the Torah in the Old Testament is not for conviction of sin. The people are already saved when they're given the law. And the law is not primarily even given to show them how they should individually live right. The law is given primarily to enable them to rule and exercise dominion. And the proof of that is just to read through it and notice how much of it has to do with that. If a fire breaks out and goes into somebody else's property, this is what you do. Well, you know, that is a ruling law. That doesn't have to do with conviction of sin particular. I mean, it can, but the main focus of it is how do you govern? How do you have good government? Again, that's not for children. That's for those who have knowledge of good and evil. And so the totality of the law in its completest form is given to those who are adults. God gives some of it when we're children, but he finishes it when we're adults. And that's the mystery. Finally, there's the manna. The manna has to do with power and life. And here again, only those who are mature should have enough energy to be able to do what they want to do. You restrain your kids. They have loads of energy, but you have to keep restraining them because they'll run wild and do foolish things. So you say, you got to be in at 11 o'clock or whatever. Whatever rules you set up to restrain the life and energy of your kids. But when we're given the totality of the manna, then we're given all of this. So to rule the world and to have the white hair of the elder and the complete Bible put on the throne with him, and we're given all of these things, the power to rule, which we didn't have before. Now, everybody wants these things. That's what Adam wanted. God came to Adam and said, if you'll just be patient, and that's what the virtue of the word no is, no makes us patient. There's all these good things out there, and God says, no, you can't have them yet. When you're an adolescent, it's hard. You know, can I have sex? No. Isn't sex good? Yeah. Can I have it? No. Not till you're married. Can I have a car? No. Why not? Because it costs a lot of money, and until you have enough money to buy your own, you can't have one. Well, can I do this? Can I do that? No. Actually, may I do this? May I do that? But we keep saying, no, wait. And then you learn patience from the word no. Adam didn't want that. He didn't want to wait. God told him he'd eventually get to eat of the tree of knowledge. He didn't want to wait. So he grabbed it and took it right then and there. That's what all of us want to do. So all the religions in the world, they offer some type of rule and knowledge and life. And they offer it falsely. All of us want Aaron's rod. Everybody wants glory and praise and status and position and name and importance. Everybody wants to be noticed and listened to. And that's true whether you're an adult or a child. You want to be noticed and listened to. Babies want to be noticed. Mothers find that out when they talk on the phone. Here's mom with the phone. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she talks on the phone with the same tone of voice she uses on the baby, and she cuddles the phone, and the baby sees that and goes berserk. I remember when ours were little, every time Brenda was on the phone, they'd start to fuss because they're jealous. It's true. You watch women talking on the phone. And you take your voice, you use your voice differently on the phone than you do when you're talking face-to-face -face because you don't have facial expressions. You have to put everything in your voice. And people coo into the phone. They talk into the phone the same way they talk to babies. And babies know it, and they think the phone is stealing attention from them, and they make a lot of noise. And that's just one example among many that we could come up with. Everybody wants to be noticed and listened to and not told to shut up. Which is okay, but if you seize Aaron's rod, it's not okay. And what the false religions, the anti-mystery religions do, is they offer status and position and importance without patience, without waiting. You can have it now. And similarly, as regards the law, the law of God, the complete Bible, gives us the wisdom of God. Well, everybody wants that. Everybody wants knowledge. And that becomes clear the instant we realize we don't know something we need to know. For instance, you're driving on the highway and your car breaks down. 
all of a sudden you realize that you need to know how to get this car going again. And then you wish you had knowledge. And that's just for starters. Everybody wants knowledge, but they go about it the wrong way. True knowledge comes from studying the scriptures. That's the start. And if we don't start there, we get false knowledge. And we got universities full of the mystery of iniquity, full of false wisdom. And then there's manna. Manna has to do with life and power, and everybody wants that. And this becomes clear the instant you become sick. Your children don't think about this very much because children are not sick very much, and when they are, they don't think they're going to die. But when you get up to be around my age and you start getting really sick, you start thinking about, gee, I might die from this. Or even more, because of your awareness of reality, you become sick and you want life and power. You want to be healed. You want the ability to do things. You want energy. Take ginsana or whatever or barley oats or whatever you take to give you life and power. All these counterfeit manas out there, these mystery of iniquity, drugs that people take for life and power. Well, I'm only kidding there a little bit. But you see, the false religions offer that. And all over the ancient world, there were things called mystery cults. And then to join the mystery cults, you go through the initiation, and then they give you the secret wisdom. And one aspect of the secret wisdom is philosopher's gold. Philosopher's gold is not gold. It's a drink that if you drink it, you will live forever because it makes you gold. It turns you into something imperishable. You know, gold doesn't even tarnish. So if you could be turned into gold, you would last forever. And so you want to drink something that makes you philosophically golden and gives you eternal life. And that's the elixir of immortality, or the fountain of youth, which is guarded by dragons and cherubim. But we in the mystery cult will teach you how to get that. Plus, we have all kinds of secret wisdom passed down to us generation after generation, all the way back to Solomon's temple, the mysteries of the great architect, G-A-O-T-U, the great architect of the universe. And that was passed down to Solomon's masons. And generation after generation, the secret hidden wisdom that gives you more insight than other people have is obtainable if you will come into the masons. And you swear an oath never to let those secrets out, secrets like the Pythagorean theorem. Well, masonry nowadays in America is not that kind of thing, but there is a strong element of it in the history of Masonry or Rosicrucianism or anything else that continues the mindset of ancient mystery religions. In fact, Rosicrucianism and Masonry and other similar organizations developed after the Renaissance as imitations of ancient mystery religions. They went back to the ancient mystery religions of Hermes, Trismegistus, and others and said, well, let's revive this. And they wanted to kind of Christianize it a little bit, but actually they were trying to do the same thing. That's why there are a lot of parallels. If you want to have the secret knowledge, then come in. And we'll teach you astral projection. You can lie in your bed and float around the world and see things that others can't see, do things others can't do. And you'll have life and power because you'll get the philosopher's gold. And you'll have power. You'll have Aaron's rod. Why? Because you have joined the secret conspiracy that actually rules the world. All these great men were Rosicrucians. Oh, Benjamin Franklin was one. You know, all these great guys were Rosicrucians. And all these great guys were Masons, like George Washington. He was a Mason. I guess he probably was. A lot of other people were. And that is used as a way of saying, if you come in with us, you're part of the Council on Foreign Relations. You get to be a Bilderberger. And you get to run everything from behind the scenes. And whether you're in these groups or not in these groups, a lot of people believe that the world is run from behind the scenes by people who are hidden away in a holy of holies somewhere pulling the strings. Don't they? 
I mean, the John Birch Society started off saying, let's fight international communism, and over the years, poor old Welsh got more and more involved in the idea that there was some secret cabal behind a screen, a holy of holies, and that they've been pulling the strings and running the world for three, four hundred years. Then there are others who say that, yeah, that exists, and it goes back to the Jesuits. They've been running the world for centuries. Others say the Jews have been running the world for centuries. There's lots of competing theories here. But I'll tell you where the secret cabal is that meets behind closed doors and rules the world. Do you know where it is? Yeah, you're looking at it. Because we and we alone are council members who get to advise God on what God ought to do. See, we're in the true mystery. This is the real mystery here. We have to understand this. This is our position. This is why Paul says, the riches of the greatness of the powers of the greatness of the riches of that He has lavished on us. Because in reality... All the things that are falsely ascribed, I'm not saying that groups don't exist that try to influence things. Groups do exist. You know, there are good old boy networks, and there are groups that influence history. But the true mastermind of history is Jesus Christ, and the people who get behind closed doors into the Holy of Holies with Him and pull the strings are us. We pull the strings. You know why we have bad government in our country today? Because we have bad government in the church. God looks down and He says, My people don't care about good government, so I'll give them bad government. You know why the government steals money from us today? Because Christians don't tithe. I don't mean they don't give. I mean they don't tithe. The Bible says if you don't give 10%, you're robbing God. You've heard that before. Now you hear it again. <laughs> now, God looks down and says, Well, they're stealing from me, so... They don't care about theft. I'll give them a government that steals from them. There's no discipline in the church. People commit adultery right and left all over the church in this country, so we have adulterers in office in our land. We don't excommunicate anybody in the church today, so we got criminals all over our country filling up prisons and being let out. We don't put them to death. We don't beat them with stripes. We don't do anything to stop them. We pull the strings. God looks at the church and sees what the church does and acts accordingly. And see, we can run conservatives for office forever, and we can come into the church and pray and say, Oh, God, give us good government, you know, keep us from war, blah, blah, blah. And it won't make any difference unless we act out, unless he can look down from heaven and see us doing right, doing the things that correspond. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, I know our church doesn't have this problem particularly, but the church at large does. And the church in America is fooling around. We have this terrible welfare problem in our country because the church isn't doing welfare. So we pull the strings. Bill Clinton is doing what the church wants him to do. I don't mean the liberal churches now. They don't count. God doesn't hear the prayers of liberals. <laughs> Well, God hears the prayers of everybody in one sense, but God isn't looking down from heaven and saying, oh, my true people in these liberal churches. No. Just because they have the word church on the outside. God is looking at the evangelical, Bible-believing Christians in this country, and He is giving them exactly what they want in the way of government. Now, they all be real surprised to hear that. But they're not going to get any tax relief until they start to tithe and stop stealing from God. And they are not going to get good government until they put government in their churches. And these churches are full of divorce and adultery. And they're full of all kinds of other things. Christians get all upset about evolution. Why is our country so filled with false doctrines, false economic theories, false scientific theories? God looks at all these churches and says they don't care to learn the scriptures. They don't care to learn what I teach. So I won't teach it to the world. You want to understand history and science, the Bible tells you. You want to understand economics, the Bible tells you. But neither our hyper-nationalistic conservatives nor our liberals understand economics. You want to shut the gates to immigration in this country, you will kill our economy. They don't understand. Most people think that there is just a limited amount of stuff in the world and we just pass it around among ourselves. 
That's not true. The Holy Spirit brings power out of eternity into time, and the world grows. And you can grow your population, and you can grow your economy, and everybody can get richer and richer. Because energy comes into creation from outside of creation, through people. That's the answer to Aristotelian economics. Well, you can't grow. So if Americans are rich, they must be stealing it from Africans who are poor. No. Mm -mm. No. It doesn't work that way. The whole system can grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Because energy comes in from outside. They don't understand that. And why don't they? Because God looks down at all the fundamentalists and evangelicals and Calvinists and Presbyterians and he sees that they don't really care to learn all this stuff. You know, they don't know who came first, Pika or Pika Haya. You know who came first, Pika or Pika Haya, I'm going to ask. We don't know this the way we ought to. Okay, none of us do. And so God looks down and says, well, they don't care to learn what I teach them, so I'll give them a whole society full of ignorance. We are the ones who pull the strings. We're behind the curtain. We're in the Holy of Holies. We have the mystery. We have Aaron's rod. We're the elders. We have the law. We have the potential to know everything and have all the knowledge. We have the manna. We have the potential to have all the energy to do what God wants us to do. And what he wants us to do is live sacrificially so that that energy is hidden in sacrificial living, but it's still energy and power. And there is a counterfeit. But the counterfeit doesn't have the power. And we don't want to look to the counterfeit for the power. Quickly. Let's finish this so next week we can look at something else. What does it mean here in Revelation when it says the mystery of God is finished? Well, the mystery of God is finished in A.D. 65 to 70 because, first of all, the new body of the church is finished. It takes a while for Jew and Gentile to get woven together into one body in Christ. First of all, we've got to go down to the Samaritans, and Jews have nothing to do with Samaritans, but then they receive the Holy Spirit and they speak in other tongues, which means the Samaritan language is legitimate vehicle for the kingdom of God. And so now we kind of weave into the Samaritans. And then we go to the Gentiles, and we have to kind of weave into the Gentiles. But by A.D. 65, that's over. And Paul has done that. He's told them, we're on one body in Christ. Stop having Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. You mustn't have that. They're just Christians. And by that body of Christ grows and now is ready by A.D. 65-70. And after that, I mean, that's the way we are today. If a Jewish person becomes a Christian, he joins the church. These Messianic synagogues are a bizarre aberration and they're false. Jewish believers ought to be in the church with everybody else. The second thing that completes the mystery of God is that the Bible is completed. I don't know what the last book of the New Testament is. I suspect it's Jude. Revelation is still telling us that an apostasy is going to come, but Jude tells us that the apostasy has arrived. So Jude would probably be the last book. But whatever is, the Bible gets finished and the mystery is finished. Now we have it all. And finally, as I understand Romans chapter 11 the final harvest of Israel takes place in the A.D. 60s. And that prediction in Romans 11.25 associates the conversion and harvest of Israel with the mystery. I don't want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in and then the Jewish fulfillment will come. I think that is predicting things that happened in the A.D. 60s. There was a big conversion of Gentiles and a final conversion and harvest of Israel. I think that that's what Revelation is talking about when it talks about the setting aside of the 144,000 and that that's part of the completion of the mystery. So that's what I think the completion of the mystery is. If you question that one, at the very least, the finishing of the body of Christ and the completion of the Scriptures are it. But the reason I've given you three things here, if you're looking at page 101, which is now 102, Aaron's rod has to do with glorified persons, and the completion of the new body of the church corresponds to that. The new person has been made. The law, which is locked up in the Holy of Holies, corresponds to the completion of the Scriptures. And the manna, which is the power of the Spirit, 
corresponds to this outpouring of the Spirit that happened in the A.D. 60s that completed the first fruits of the mystery. So that's why I think those three elements are there in the completion of the mystery of God. Any questions real quick? I'm sorry I went over time, but I wanted to get this done. Uh-huh. Okay. After E. James Kennedy had said where he comes on Charles Corral and his liberal junk that he loves to deliver, this morning he was commenting on the firing of 40,000 E. James employees. Yeah. Giving us the typical liberal dribble concept that you were describing. There's a lump of labor out there, there's a lump of jobs to be done, and these vicious corporations for the sake of short run uh, quarterly profits. I'll lay off all these people. And the whole idea of a market economy growing, and when you have people replaced by capital and therefore the remaining people more productive, so the guys can go get other jobs, that they can be more productive too, it's just like it's, it's not there. Yeah. No concept of a growing economy. It's all this you know, little junk. Well, you have the same thing with this business about if we have a tax cut, where are we going to find the money to make it up and balance the budget? And, you know, uh, the conservatives are saying if you cut taxes, <laughs> people will make more money and you'll have more money coming in. But they have no understanding of history and growth. But I tell you, they're not the only ones who think they're conservatives who think that way, too. Well, okay, our time is up. Save page 103. And next time we're going to look at the fact that this word that John eats is like honey in his mouth, but it's bitter in his stomach. And you might remember that when the suspected adulteress drinks the water, it's bitter in her stomach. And that's what we're going to be looking at. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you that you give us access to the hidden knowledge and to the hidden wisdom and to the hidden power that's behind the curtain. We know that we forget that we are the ones who actually pull the strings in history by the way we behave. You look at us and then you run the world accordingly. Help us to live righteously and to pray righteously so that the world is changed. We ask that you bless us now as we draw near to worship you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.